join our Patreon. Welcome back, part two, Mystery Schools. Derek, so what were you talking about, brother? I have no idea. I'm just making it up as I go along. I kind of, it sounds a little bit, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I was touching on uh, the whole concept of genealogy versus analogy. Uh, if something's analogical, if we're talking about analogy, analogical similarities, we're talking about um, things that are similar, but not necessarily related or dependent upon one another. Uh, they just have, you know, an air of similarity. If it's genealogical, if we're talking about genealogy, then there may be, uh, we're talking about something where there's a genetic link where uh, one might have influenced the other. Um, I think that this can be something of a bifurcation fallacy when we're talking about this stuff. Um, because sometimes you have cases in which it's both analogy and genealogy. Think about uh, a composer who writes music. Um, he is probably innovating to a good degree, producing something entirely new and unique, but he cannot think musical thoughts in isolation or in a vacuum. He is inevitably going to be influenced by things that he has heard before and not from any one particular song but from you know a whole panoply of uh of songs that he's heard before um that's the kind of process we're talking about um the reason i bring that up is because i wanted to get into um you know to basically transition from the ancient Egyptian mortuary cult into the Greco-Roman mystery religions. And as I was uh, talking about, um, ancient Egypt appears to have had quite an impact on the Greco-Roman world. And a lot of uh, mystical and magical practices were adopted by the Greco-Romans because of the fact that ancient Egypt was this world of great mystique and magic and power and wisdom. Um, but uh, you begin to see, such as with uh, Dionysus, we had talked about the identification of Dionysus with Osiris and some of the syncretization that was going on there. And there were, of course, the Orphic mysteries of Dionysus. There were other mysteries of Dionysus as well, but I really want to touch on the Orphic mysteries because here's where we have another really close analogy to Christianity and to the ancient Egyptian cult. Um, the myth was that the Titans had dismembered Dionysus and he was restored, you know, reassembled and restored to life variously by Rhea or Demeter and, uh, and he lived again. The Orphics believed that they too uh, could be reborn um, evidently in the image of, of Dionysus or the Orphic Dionysus according to golden tablets that are found um, from uh, dating back to the fourth or fifth centuries BC, they talk about the initiate um, being um, reborn on this very day, thrice blessed. He, they're thrice blessed as, as Dionysus was thrice born, uh, thrice blessed or thrice happy. Again, you see the parallelism between the devotee and the God, that the devotee has undergone what the God himself underwent, uh, that there is this mystical identification. They too underwent a process of theosis, becoming divine or immortal, uh, to be able to live on in the next life and, the, and, and uh, look forward to not just the doom and gloom of Hades, as some warn, but to a blessed and happy afterlife. Um, again, there is this, this tie-in, and, and one cannot one cannot unsee the sort of parallel there between the Orphic cult of Dionysus, where he's dismembered, reassembled, raised to life, and his devotees therefore share in that uh, in that that fortunate lot, and you know, in a happy afterlife, and and become divinized themselves, much as what you find in the ancient Egyptian cult there does seem to be some kind of uh, very possibly a genetic link there. 
Um, I think I had mentioned to you last night too, there was a, a motif of being, of falling into milk. Um, that had something to do with the whole notion of rebirth and immortality and the orphan cult. Um, milk was identified with the Milky Way. Um, that's not a coincidence. Baptism. Um, yeah, the ancient, absolutely. The ancient Egyptians saw the Milky Way into them in some sense. I don't think they realized that it was a massive grouping of stars, but that it was this celestial kind of magical event or, or uh, domain in the sky. So by uh, falling into milk, you were falling into that domain and being reborn as a god in the sky and the heavens. This, this, I, I have to comment. This is great because you, you literally tie in John Knight Lunwall. I mentioned in, in the first part. Uh, he talked about the flood of Noah. I've never heard other scholars that have come on and talk about this, but there's a there's a theme in the Epic of Gilgamesh where it's in Noah as well. And the idea that there's salvation or eternal life in this um, in this judgment narrative of water, uh, it, and most scholars scratch their head and go, "How does the judgment and water bring salvation? What is this this judgment of water? How is that even going to bring salvation?" And John Knight Lunwall thinks, if I'm not mistaken, this is not verbatim, but something to this aspect that the flood is not talking about some local Mediterranean flood here. This, 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 don't get me wrong. You could take it that way and find that there were previous floods. Are you there? Derek. You got stuck on me, man. You there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, you froze for a good yeah. while. Yeah, sorry about that. No, Satan's trying to, I get it, you know. Sorry, just if you get behind me. Um, so what I was saying, <laughs> no, you glitched out, but John Knight Lunwell was saying that the flood, uh, though it could have had plenty of floods happen locally in the world, you know, uh, he believes it's celestial. And that there's a key here in which most scholars can't understand how eternal salvation or salvation like that and the flood play a role. Most people would say salvation from the flood is just simply literal salvation from the dangers of water. And that's it. Um, he believes there's like a mystery cult scenario here in the mysteries of this religion. Uh, it's found in the Epic of Gilgamesh too, hmm. where I think and I, I, I'm not certain he swims down to get something, the, the something of youth or something in the Epic of Gilgamesh and beneath the waters, you know, he has to go down and get it. And he, he acquires this thing. They didn't think he could. Uh, there's something with waters, flood and salvation here. And he thinks Milky Way is playing a huge part in the Noah story. Interesting that I hadn't heard. Yeah. Something else that I came across, I was reading uh, just before uh, we got in contact, I was looking again at SGF Brandon's uh, discussion about the, uh, the parallels between the ancient Egyptian mortuary cult concerning Osiris and, uh, and you know, the, uh, the Pauline form of Christianity. He did discuss um, these... Um, uh, baptism type practices, even as far back as in the ancient Egyptian cult, where they were washed or purified in lustrations of water. Um, you know, who'd have thunk, but that's even that goes way back. Um, th that brings up another point where, um, you know, you'll, you'll see some apologists try to say, look, you cannot appeal to rituals like baptism or communal meals and suggest that that's borrowed from the mystery religions because those were already Jewish rituals. Those were already aspects, aspects of Judaism. Mm -hmm. Well, even if you want to argue that, and, I, and I'd say given some of these examples, in particular what, uh, what Brandon touches on uh, concerning baptisms in ancient Egypt, I don't know that that's necessarily the case, but let me just go ahead and, and grant you that. Um, 
what Jewish scholars are, are very astute at picking up on is that, yeah, these may have been Jewish or, you know, rituals originally, but the, the significance that is attached to them now in the New Testament under Paul is entirely different. It's taken on a new mystical significance that it did not have before. There's this new mystical connotation that's being applied here. So whereas the Jewish ritual of baptism might have been about purification, well, let's, let's just get right to the point here. This is where I uh, eventually wanted to get to. <laughs> and uh, I want to quote from Paul here. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. There you see this sort of mystical uh, identification with Christ and the parallel interaction of death and rebirth or new life between the devotee and the deity. Colossians chapter 2 verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And then uh, Philippians chapter 3 verses 10 through 11, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Here, baptism in Paul takes on a new meaning and significance, one that very closely aligns to the mystery religions, so that even if it was exoterically a Jewish ritual originally, it is now uh, esoterically a mystery religion type ritual, a Greco-Judaic hybrid, so to speak. I can attest to that, even with something that's a non-mystery school necessarily, <laughs> even though I, I would... It wouldn't surprise me if it was. Where in First Corinthians nine, uh, I had Rabbi Tovi Singer come on and talk about how doc, uh, how Paul quotes somewhere in Deuteronomy, and when he does, he reinterprets what it means. He literally quotes it when he's arguing with these Corinthians, saying, "Listen, you know, is it just me and Barnabas are the only two who can't, you know, marry and you know, or uh, have a job, something to this effect?" Uh, pretty much what he's trying to get at when he goes and he quotes this is. The, in Deuteronomy, God says to the Israelites, listen, you can't muzzle your oxen while it treads. It's supposed to be able to eat. You're supposed to let the oxen eat. Don't starve it while it's trying to make food for you. That's pretty much what it says in Deuteronomy. And you notice this often in the Enochian literature, Enoch. They do this kind of mystery school stuff because what they do is they tell you, oh, eating of a pig, it's not literally meaning Eating, eating a pig. What it's saying is don't be like the pig and what the pig does is this. And so like it reinterprets what the Deuteronomic or the, the Levitical or the Exodus law says. And Paul requote, requotes it and says, does God care about oxen? This is what he says in First Corinthians 9. It's like putting a new spin on all of this stuff. Yeah. Does God care about oxen? No. That's, that's syncretism right there. You're, yeah binding the old with the new and you're you're adopting it and adapting it and and spinning it in a new light exactly uh, so if you, you know the apologists who say no this stuff was they, they don't know what they're talking about i'm sorry um no i'm not <laughs> <laughs> um what else uh as far as the mystery religions go um you had the mysteries of eleusis the eleusinian mysteries this involved the uh, the abduction or rape of Persephone or Kor, as she was known, into the underworld by Hades, and then her returning to the land of living. Uh, so more of a catabasis than strictly a death and resurrection, so to speak, but it's still something along the, you know, um, along the lines of uh, representing death and rebirth. It was tied into the death and rebirth of the crops and Demeter, uh, mourned and bewailed the loss of Persephone, just as Isis did for Osiris or Anath for Bel. Um, 
And uh, in these mysteries, again, there was, you know, we don't get a whole lot of, of, of uh, insight into what took place during these rituals, but we know that they were shown like an ear of wheat, or uh, uh, so to speak, that there was some tie in with the death of the planted seed, probably in its, its rebirth uh, to new life, um, so that the initiate was probably um, impressed with the notion that just like the the you know the the crops die and, and rise to new life, just as Persephone or Kor had to go into the underworld of death and reemerge alive again, so too shall you have the same fate. Uh, and we know from these ancient texts like Pindar and Sophocles that the uh, the participants in the mysteries of Eleusis hoped for a better afterlife and to avoid the pains of of death and of hell. That brings me to another point I want to touch on that uh, another way that apologists will try to drive the wedge is by saying, well, the mystery religion participants would go on to live a happy afterlife in heaven, whereas Jews and Christians hoped to have a temporal existence in a new body here on earth. That's where they'll try to drive the wedge. Again, they are ignoring passages in the New Testament where you still have the idea of heavenly ascent, such as in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, where you have, he doesn't call it the rapture, but that's the concept that's alive there. Um, Christ will return. Those uh, who have died in Christ will be raised to be with him in the air, uh, they'll be taken first, and then the rest of us who are still alive will go up to be in the air with him. Uh, and then uh, as we were talking about with Dr. Price when I interviewed him, and I think it was uh, John chapter 14, where uh, Christ says, you know, I'll be gone, but I'll be returning from heaven, and I'll be taking you guys up with me. You're going to be coming with me. This idea of, of spiritual ascent or even if it was in the new body, still going to another celestial sphere or realm is alive in the New Testament as well, precisely because um, Christianity was not a monolith any more than any of these other ancient religions were. There were variant views of the afterlife, what kind of body you'd have or where you would end up being located. So uh, that view is alive in the New Testament as well, and I don't think you can legitimately drive that wedge without just completely ignoring what's in your own <laughs> cherished holy book. I don't get it. Yeah. And I could see issues. You could try and like find contradictions. Like uh, Revelation talks about the kingdom, uh, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Right. Uh, and then first Thessalonians is talking about you going up and it's mm -hmm. like, Okay, Acts talks about uh, he's ascending, but then his return is also supposed to be another descent. In the same manner in which I left, I will return. Well, has that happened? You know, so does he mean literal? Uh, literal? I, it's it's complicated because if that's an apotheosis of his ascension, then you know there, this might be mystery school language where we're not really able to grasp the concept and Christians literalize it, of course. And then here you go finding ways to try and make things make sense the best they can or fit their doctrine or whatever. I, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, they try to harmonize because they just assume that all of this is cohesive and it's not. Um, and even if you want to say that that Jewish idea of resurrection is retained in the new Testament, it doesn't change the fact that the, uh, the, the mysticism of the mystery religions remains so that, you know, even if they achieve af the afterlife or immortality in a body versus a soul in the heavens, it's still the same means to get there. It's, it's, it's again, it's, it's, it is a Greco-Judaic hybrid or assimilation. They're combining, syncretizing, fusing uh, various beliefs and ideas and practices so that you'll have both similarities and differences. So appealing to the differences just doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else? We talked about the Illusionian mysteries. Um, the Greco-Roman 
mysteries of Isis and Osiris. So of course there was a Greco-Roman version of the ancient Egyptian mystery religion. And uh, in this one, we do get uh, a pretty close look at what's going on here in terms of the ritual and its meaning in Apuleius's account in, uh, in Metamorphoses or the Golden Ass in Book 11. And he talks about for uh, the initiate, for Lucian, uh, it was a process of, of death and rebirth that he, uh, he approaches the frontiers of death and having been born through the elements, he is uh, reborn and he's uh, 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 renewed, set once more upon the course of renewed life, very much like the way Paul talks about walking in newness of life. Uh, so we do get a real close glimpse at a mystery uh, uh, element there in Apuleius. Again, they might say, well, yeah, but this is from the second century CE. Well, read uh, J. Gwyn Griffiths. He was the uh, uh, renowned scholar concerning the uh, Egyptian religion, Isis and Osiris. He discusses Apuleius' account and talks about how it is very much in continuity with the ancient Egyptian cult of Osiris. And even though um, it doesn't explicitly say that uh, Apuleius doesn't say that Lucian is identified with Osiris here. Uh, Griffiths makes the case that that is precisely what is going on. Um, he is now once reborn in the bosom of the mysteries. He is um, wearing the crown of justification and has the accoutrements of a solar deity, which is very much the assimilation of Osiris and Ray. Um, you know, this has been such a long standing tradition in the ancient Egyptian religion that there's no denying that that's still what's going on here, even in the Greco Roman Egyptian cult. So that by now, whereas in the Egyptian cult, uh, one was identified with Osiris in death, in literal death, and then raised to immortality in a new life, um, now. Uh, it's happening in the here and now, once initiated, now you're reborn already in this life, but you still have to look forward to the culmination of that upon death, just as what yeah. happens in the Pauline form of baptism. And I, and I seriously doubt that Paul had innovated this or that he was the first. I think that what we're seeing in Apuleius is something that had already laid ground. Yeah, Romans 8 also, I mean, yes, of course, baptism, and this was a known Gnostic thing as well. Uh, it, it, teachings like the the heresies of Hymenaeus and Philetus that we find, which is just briefly mentioned, how they led so many astray by saying the resurrection from the dead has already happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, that tells you there's Christian sects right there that believe that there's a future yet resurrection, and there are others that say the resurrection already happened. Well, what does it mean? And we can't, we don't want to lose our definitions of what these terms mean. But when I read the Gospel of Thomas, I think I got a clear definition of what Hymenaeus and Philetus think, because it's the closest reference when I was looking up any reference. There's not another reference that I'm aware of that connects Hymenaeus and Philetus and this in the Gospel of Thomas, saying 51 and 113. And in there, he's talking about, they said, Lord, when will the repose of the dead take place? And when will the blah, blah, blah? Sounds very much like Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, the whole, when, uh, when, will, you, when will these things happen? He goes, I tell you the truth, uh, here are the signs, all that. Well, Jesus says, look around. The resurrection's already occurred. You just can't see it. Well, this resurrection, I think, is a Gnostic one, which you find clearly as a, as a heresy in one of the letters. But it's probably a heresy that was taught by Paul. But then this is where it gets weird. In Romans 8, you have he who, um, those he justifies, he'll sanctify. Uh, pretty much those who justifies, he and he's going to end up glorifying. So if you are getting justified, you're going to end up glorified in Paul's doctrine. And I suspect justified is initiated, uh, which means you're resurrected. You're crucified with Christ. You are resurrected with christ already and then it, you're also guaranteed the afterlife scenario so yeah i'm with you on that and justification was a big element there we know in the ancient egyptian cult as well um after horus had defeated set 
that's Osiris's brother who had murdered and, and dismembered him. Um, Osiris was found justified uh, and declared free of sin, even uh, Mark J. Smith says, uh, so that the, the ancient Egyptian initiate was also justified, declared free of sin, and there was also the crown or wreath of justification, which uh, signified their being justified as they uh, were vindicated and raised as he was. So, you know, it, it really begins to blow your mind when you see just how many different um, how many different lines of evidence there are and how many different, the many different varieties and ways of, of, um, of parallelism between the old and the new. It's, it's, it's staggering almost. Um, I was also going to talk about, of course, we discussed the, the imagery, you know, the death of the planted seed and it's sprouting to new life. That imagery is used, and of course, in, in Paul and in uh, and in John. Um, you know, this is probably not a coincidence. Yes, they're using that as uh, sort of a metaphor for what happens to uh, you know the death of the body and it's sprouting to new life. So it was also in the in the ancient mysteries, which were as, as much about transformation as they were about deification. I mean, naturally, you were transformed into something divine. Um, and it's agricultural. This is the absolutely. thing that I wish I told Dr. Bob, I say it all the time. I'm like, man, while you had William Lane Craig there, you should have really slammed this one. But he tried to scoot away and dis discredit agricultural connections to the Christian myth. And I've heard others like Christopher Hansen and other guys who, uh, who want to say, Get, it, get rid of the agricultural ideas. So if I bring up parables of the seed, or the sower, or if I bring up the wheat and the chaff, or I bring up the, the vineyard owner, or if I bring up, you know, the fig tree out of season, hint, hint, you know, I start talking about these things. Oh, well, you just start, you're, you're not really looking at the, the you're not looking at it through the milieu or you're not understanding that this they're all common farmers that they're teaching this to duh don't you realize and i'm thinking to myself wow what a cop out because it yeah. does sound very mystery school agricultural like and i understand there's the reluctance to try and give an inch because some people take a mile and the mile goes past if the path is only half a mile long, they will go a mile zeitgeist. Okay. Yeah. But if you, you, there should be something there to say, okay, okay, we'll, we'll admit, we'll confess there's something. I deal with other fundamentalists uh, out there that harmonize everything. There's not a single new Testament book and they don't believe that the canon is sacred or believe that things um, that we have are inerrant, infallible, but they treat it with the same methodology of inerrancy and such. And I'm like, don't you see the conflict and the issue between the Petrine and the Pauline? Don't you see they didn't like each other and they taught different doctrines? Uh, well, eh, hold on, let's try and make it work first before we try to find issues. What if, what if you're, that's not the scientific method, number one, but what if it isn't? Are you going to make it work no matter what? Because that's when you come up with stuff like James saying works by salvation or salvation by works, and I'll show you my faith by doing my works, and that's how Abraham was justified. And then Paul talks about Galatians 3, justified by faith and not of works, and then talks about in the pseudo, you know, Ephesus or the Ephesian document where he's saying, listen, grace to faith, not of works, hint, hint, pop, or the Roman scenario, pop, right there against works. So – I say that, how do you deal with that? Oh, well, James is talking to different people, probably just Jews. Therefore, the Jews are supposed to keep working, and that's their version of salvation. But since Paul's talking to Gentiles, their version of salvation is different, so they can have grace through faith, not of works. And therefore, James and Paul are buddies. And it's like, what level? I mean, you'll find anything. It's like the loophole in the law for a lawyer. They will find a loophole, oh, yeah. even if you yeah. the glove doesn't fit. Though you must acquit. It's like I love it, it, that's perfect. I was just about to say Price compares these uh, to uh, the defense attorneys for O.J. Simpson um, because that's <laughs> exactly what they are. It's willful ignorance. It's turning a, a blind eye to what 
is obvious to those of us who are approaching this rationally. Um, you know, and there are a lot of smart people uh, who very well read, very well informed, who really know their stuff, but for whatever reason, and I can only speculate as to what that is, but for whatever reason, they're not looking at this objectively. They're not doing so rationally. Before you move on, because I know you have more to bring in, just one quick comment, I guess. Do you think, and this is just your opinion, and this is all subjective, and it, you know, nothing wrong with this. Do you think that the reason they're resistant and reluctant to even go down this path is they think this is going to feed fuel to the fire of anti-religious uh, propaganda and the, in their view, technically, regardless, regardless if you saw a pattern or parallel, uh, we can explain them away. Like I just explained away James and, P and Paul, everybody should know they're best friends. Didn't you know that? Didn't you know that? So what I'm saying is, is do you think it's the anti-religious rhetoric and they're just sick and sick of seeing people who don't believe it and they just want to poke holes and they just want to talk about how the book's not true or this and that. So therefore we can't feed that side of things. We got to find somewhere that's less possible in terms of jabbing or, or, or saying Jesus is just like other gods. And that, you know, there's not this unique, this is the special religion. No, it takes away all that special do you think that they're trying to protect that, even if they don't believe it? Well, um, I think it almost goes without saying that if you're trying to cling to Christianity as a uniquely inspired divine revelation, it's not possible to do that when you recognize that it is basically cut from the same cloth of the ancient world as the rest of these myths and ideas. Um, that's not to say that it was not unique in its own instantiation of these kinds of things. Okay. It's being a Greco-Judaic hybrid religion makes it a unique blend of Judaism with Hellenistic and uh, other exotic faiths. But it's nonetheless, it's, it's just... Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's precisely the type of thing that we would expect to arise from the ancient world, from its, its time and place, from the cultural and sociological factors involved. And in realizing that, clearly you, you realize that there's no, it's superfluous to appeal to any kind of divine revelation uh, it's it's all too obvious that this is just something that is quite uh, quite frankly man made and is a product of its time and place, the product of man. Um, you know, do I have a uh, an anti religious agenda? Um, yes and no. Um, you know, I think that religion does do a lot of harm in this world, especially uh, among those on the religious right, you know, the politically motivated who are trying to uh, put in place something of a theocracy and tell the rest of us that we have to live according to their rules. I think that that's harmful. And uh, I think it's, it's uh, responsible, only, you know, responsible of us to, to keep those folks in check and speak out against that kind of thing. But, um, but there are also a lot of uh, religious and people in this world who I think are harmless. Um, I don't side completely with uh, Richard Dawkins or, or Christopher Hitchens in that I don't, review, I don't view religion or, or religious people as the enemy necessarily. Um, there are a lot of religious people in my life, Derek, whom I love and adore, and I wouldn't have them any other way. Yeah. And I'm not trying to pry their faith out of their hands. Absolutely not. Um, I am defending my non-belief, sure. And I'm taking a genuine interest in these topics because they genuinely fascinate me. But um, I'm, not, I'm not out to, in other words, I'm not an anti-theist. I'm not out to destroy religion. I don't think it's a better idea to have a world in which there is no religion. I'm not on that track. I have a problem with a particular stripe of 
fundamentalist <laughs> in across the board right. is fundamentalist. You know, I do have a problem with that. And I, and I, have, you know, I, I won't hesitate to admit that at the same time, I'm not going to allow that to pervert my journey of discovery when it comes to trying to understand the origins and development right. of the Christian faith. If I find out something I've said or written is, is false or debunked um, or just doesn't carry the weight of the evidence, I'll get rid of it. I'll discard it. I, you know, I'm trying to arrive at the truth. So one could arguably say that there might be a bias or agenda on my part, but I, I try to, as Nietzsche said, we all view the world through our own subjective lens. Mm -hmm. The point is to, to combat that, to try and rise above it, broaden your horizons, don't let it get the best of you, do your absolute damnedest to approach things as objectively as you possibly can. Even if, you know, even if you reach for the stars, you may not reach them, but you're not going to come up with a right. handful of dirt either. I'm with you. And I just, I think I've heard quite a bit from those who are not Christians that are trying to debate or say that where you're going with this is still mistaken, um, that it's an anti-religious or that, you know, they, I think they're, worried because there are some people that appear to them to be anti-religious i guess and so they're trying to protect uh or they suspect you you don't know what you're talking about uh i think dr bob has an idea of what he's talking about and he agrees with what you're saying here so uh, all of this i mean not just dying and rising god motifs mystery school motifs and the such and he's the biggest teddy bear i know i've i've I could have that guy sit down with anyone, literally. And by the way, there might be a conversation between Rabbi Tobias Singer. This is an Orthodox Jew. Right. Who believes be that the first man is six, 7,000 years old, okay? Like they have an Old Testament literalist, uh, you know, uh, mm. position. And, um, or Hebrew scriptures, if you will. Uh, but uh, he's going to sit down probably and talk to him, and they're going to do a show focusing on the New Testament together. This way it'll be kind of like, wow, what kind of collaboration? What an amazing, interesting duo. Yes. Uh, you wouldn't expect that to be. But it doesn't matter who you are. The guy is not anti-religious, and he sees this stuff. So uh, I didn't want to stop you too long, but uh, if you want to keep going, we can. Try and wrap this anyway. I was okay. talking about the the imagery, um, the sort of agricultural. Yes, uh, those agricultural vestiges are there, but they begin to sort of fade away as these, you know, because these cults or movements they evolve, of course, and they begin to take on new meaning and significance. But you can still find hints of those agricultural vestiges, and you find them within Christianity, I'm afraid to say as well. And I think to deny that is to just, you know, just <laughs> to stick your head in the historical sands. Um, the terminology that is used that you find uh, just swimming throughout the Pauline uh, epistles, uh, where that converges with the mystery religions, uh, the very word mysterion uh, in Greek, um, that's used 27 times in the New Testament, 21 of which are by Paul. Um, you most frequently find it there. Mysterion uh, is rooted in the Greek Mayan, which means to close, um, which has a twofold meaning there. In the mystery religions, uh, it was to close the lips to maintain secrecy, mm -hmm. but it was also to close the eyes so that you experienced the darkness, death, and in reopening them, you again see the light. Uh, His acts experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and that brings us to uh, epoptis, uh, which is witnessing or beholding, and you see the importance of that in the New Testament, and just like you were talking about, um, you know, Paul defends his apostleship by appealing to the fact that he himself has seen Christ. I wanna say it's 1 Corinthians 9, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but that also in 1 Corinthians 15, he, he's just, he's including himself there in the list saying, hey, 
And I saw him, you know, I saw him too. Yep. Uh, you know, I think he it was, a, I think it's in the elsewhere in first Corinthians where he talks about, you know, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord? You realize the importance of, uh, of apostleship being tied to having seen or witnessed or beheld the risen Christ. Um, also, um, Talios, uh, perfection or maturity. This seems to have originally been rooted in the idea of the crops having grown to their full level of having reached maturity, having grown to that full level. And the same kind of meaning is applied to the mystery cult initiates. They are, um, they are made perfect. You see this uh, throughout Paul's epistles um, as one uh, being made perfect uh, in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, Plutarch talked about those who are perfect and initiated by the mysteries, this idea of perfection or maturity. Um, and then um, Nepios, which talks about babes. Uh, we talk about Paul, you know, Paul, Paul, excuse me, talked about uh, the babes in Christ. These are the newly reborn, sort of like the ones who are, um, who fall into milk. Uh, the newly reborn or immature, newly initiated, um, who will go on to become talios or perfected or mature. Uh, it's no coincidence that we find this stuff in the Pauline epistles and the, the ties, the links to the mystery religions. Um, you can do like Bruce Metzger did, which is to try and drive a wedge in there and say, ah, but these terms are used differently, you know, and apply in different ways in the New Testament than, you know, mystery religion X. That's the case for every single mystery religion. Richard Carrier does an absolutely stellar job uh, covering this in On the Historicity of Jesus, where whether or not you agree with Carrier's views uh, regarding the historicity of Jesus, even if you think that book is completely wrong when it comes to mythicism, he's on point uh, when he's discussing this, uh, the mystery cult terminology as it's applied there. Absolutely stellar job. Um, and uh, what else was I going to say? Uh, when it comes to the apologetics concerning the mystery religions, a great source for this is Earl Doherty on uh, his site. You can find it online and read it for free. The Mystery Cults and Christianity and the Jesus Puzzle. Just search the Jesus Puzzle. Uh, go to the supplemental uh, articles and you'll find the Mystery Cults and Christianity parts A, B, C, and D. Uh, he delves right into uh, some of the most prominent apologetics as they pertain to uh, defending Christianity against influence from the mysteries. Um, you know, Gunter Wagner, who wrote sort of the Bible when it comes to battling the idea that there was Greek or mystery cult influence in Christianity, Earl Doherty just goes through one argument after another and pries them apart and basically makes the point that these guys are missing the forest for the trees. It seems that the apologetic tactic is to appeal to the, de you know, the devil in the details. I say, and so does Doherty, you're missing the forest for the trees. It depends on how far or how, um, how far you choose to zoom in or out with your metaphorical lens. You know, if you, if you go in too close, sure, you're gonna be able to see these various distinctions and so forth, as you would expect from a syncretistic faith. But if you back out a little bit and just kind of look at the, the, the wider correspondences, so to speak, you can see quite clearly that this is all kind of the same stuff. It's all cut from the same cloth. I love that because it's good to, it's healthy to have both, to really see it both. Absolutely. And, yeah. And I, I could see like from a. Because the distinctions are important, but they do not make the case that apologists want them to make. Right. Yeah. I'm a big satellite view kind of guy. Don't get me wrong. I love getting into the details, but when you look at it from the satellite, you got to go, man, uh, the, the evolutionary model of how these things became and progressively developed. It's fascinating. It, it truly is fascinating because it goes to show even Christianity is, it, it's cut, like you said, from the same cloth or it's evolving the same way as all the others. And it still is to this day. It's, 
it's not going to stop. That's the kind of crazy thing is that, well, he didn't come back 2000 years ago. Like you said, uh, let's figure out a way to make this work. And now we have new theories that came out like 1840 something with the whole um, preterist understanding that Jesus actually did return. Uh, they, everybody missed it. Uh, he did come back and that's a fundamentalist approach because he said he was coming and he can't lie. So, but um Derek, this is wonderful, man. Thank you so much for coming on here and sharing some of the mystery school stuff. I know we have a lot more shows to do on this topic. We'll go into topic-related uh, subjects. If you I want. would like to end on a note from yes. Rabbi Samuel Sandmal, if that's okay. all right. Um, because uh, this is the guy, Rabbi Samuel Sandmal, who coined the term parallelomania. This is the guy who said, hey, look, man, sometimes this goes too far. And I'm, I'm right there with him, you know, when we talk about zeitgeist and some of that stuff. But uh, coming from him, here's what he has to say concerning the, uh, the mystery religions. The similarities between Pauline Christianity and the mystery religions need to be recognized, for only then can one glimpse that what Paul was offering his hearers was not a new purpose or a new vision, but a new form of a familiar need and goal. He was teaching not a different salvation, but a newer version. And as he insisted, the only form of salvation, not a strange or recondite religious goal, but what he considered to be the sure and sole means of achieving the commonly recognized goal of religion. Um, and in fact, I lied. Um, much as I want to bring San, Rabbi Samuel Samuel into the picture, I actually want to end with, uh, with Marvin Meyer, uh, who wrote this, uh, this source book on uh, the ancient mysteries. Uh, in his epilogue, Dying and Rising in Christianity and the Other Mysteries, um, it's not only has he kind of covered that whole territory, uh, you know, discussing these ancient texts and so forth, but he goes on to say here in the epilogue, for Paul and for countless Christian believers after Paul, Christ is preeminently a dying and rising Savior. And those who follow Christ participate in the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. We have died with Christ, Paul proclaims, and we shall be raised with Christ. When Paul explains the nature of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, he employs images familiar to devotees of the mystery religions. For example, the Eleusinian Mysteries, a seed of wheat or some other grain that dies and then rises, that's emphasized. Um, I'm going to skip past some of this. And uh, Paul's ver vision of Christ as a dying and rising Savior re is reminiscent of other Savior figures and other Greco-Roman mystery religions, um, which have carried the day as the dominant formulation of the, of the Christian gospel. Uh, the story of the death and, and uh, the death of Jesus in Christian thought resembles more closely the stories of the deaths of savior figures in the mystery religions. The story of the dying and rising deity is one of the oldest stories in the world and fertility deities like Baal and Badi, the dying and rising of crops is recounted in the mythic cycles of death and rebirth. I'm getting there. <laughs> Some scholars have argued that the image of the dying and rising gods and goddesses in the mystery religions is fanciful, uh, and that these deities do not actually rise as Jesus is said to have risen. They may indeed die like Jesus, but thereafter they stay where they belong, that is, dead. Such critique of dying and rising deities may well be motivated by apologetic concerns designed to maintain the uniqueness of the resurrected Christ. In fact, the deities of the mystery religions provide ample evidence for the proclamation of the continuation of life and the manifestation of new life in the mysteries. Now I'll end on this. Uh, it may well be that Christianity witnesses to the triumph of Baal, Kor, and all the other dying and rising gods and goddesses in the proclamation of the death and resurrection of Christ. In Christianity, the ancient story of the dying and rising of the divine, of crops, of humans, of all, may reach a powerful conclusion, and the piety of the mysteries may achieve a final vindication. In Christianity, the pure light that shines, according to Clement, may be the light of those enlightened by the ancient mysteries. Ooh. Powerful conclusion. Yes, I say you need to read these books, too, and get, get, get the book that comes out with John Loftus and uh, and, and Dr. Price and you, Derek Bennett, I really appreciate you coming on, man. We got to go into more of these and go into better. We'll go into like more close-ups and go into the details more, even though we did some of that as well. Um, mm -hmm. 
the, all the ways to support whatever you're doing is down in the description. He also has a book for those who are non-believers who are interested in recovery. You guys need to check that out down in the description as well. Is That is on Amazon, correct? Uh, yes. So yeah. they definitely... It's a non-believer's path to recovery. And there's a lot in there that I think is important. Uh, both you and I are no longer in the faith, and yet we are sober, clean, whatever you like to say. So um, with that being said, uh, I hope the light stays with you, my friend. <laughs> Ditto. Right? And uh, and uh, if you guys uh, want to hear from Derek, you have any questions or anything, you guys can email me, mythvisionpodcast at gmail.com. And I'll be promising uh, not to let him know anything. No, I'm just kidding with you. But uh, I'll definitely read. Facebook re as well. Yeah, he's on Facebook. And yeah, we hang out. We got to do more of these for sure and go into specific details and stuff. Like I said, we'll zoom in. And if you haven't uh, figured it out by now, we are Myth Vision. <laughs> Join our Patreon. We are Myth Vision.